<laughs> All right. Howdy, partners. You're listening to Conversations with Jacob, hosted by my good friend, Jacob Waller. Make sure to check out the podcast where podcasts are available and check out the video version on YouTube. You can follow us on social media. Facebook is Conversations with Jacob. Twitter is at CWJ Podcast. And you can visit our website, Conversations with Jacob Podcast. Weebly. Com. Hey, you got a show idea? Maybe a guest suggestion? Email us at Conversations with Jacob at Gmail. Com. Now, Here's your host, Jacob Waller. And what's going on, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Conversations with Jacob. I mean, we got a good episode lined up for you. I know that was, I know I say that every Monday, but it's true. Uh, but before we get to our guest today, I want to do a few podcast plus, you know, like I always do. Uh, of course, you heard Jake Thorne telling you about the social medias, Facebook and Twitter. And also the email and website, so I'm not going to go over those. Uh, but you can find the podcast on iHeartRadio, and we're on Amazon, and we're on Audible, Pandora. Uh, you know, every now and then, uh, the podcast is on uh, uh, the podcast is on YouTube every once in a while. But there's been a few that uh, just want audio. Um, also, uh, the website you can find upcoming uh, episodes, past guests, posts from the host, and a bunch more also if you also if you like podcasts check out two chairs no waiting it's an andy griffin fan podcast hosted by adam newsome check it out to cherish no waiting.com i checked it out last week and it's a pretty good podcast because i like andy griffin myself uh also today is january 8th which is elvis presley's birthday and i became an elvis fan about 19 20 some years ago and I'm only uh, 28, so, you know, it kind of shows my age there a bit. So well, I figure, you know, January 8th, why not talk about Elvis Presley? And that's where my guest today comes in. Uh, uh, my guest today is Deborah Presley Brando. So, Deborah, always oh, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Now, for people who don't know nothing about who you are, can you give us a little background on yourself? Yes. Um, I am um, Elvis's oldest um, daughter. I was born just before, actually, I was conceived just before he became famous. And my mother married someone else at the time. She was 16 years old. And while I was in the womb, he skyrocketed so um they made a decision that i wouldn't be told about it because i was better off not knowing and then when i turned 21 um i found out the truth although i always kind of had an idea but um they were trying to protect everyone concerned now people that's watching this and they're going to have their doubts on their criticism and stuff like that but do you expect people to believe that you're elvis's daughter uh, not unless they know my story, no, because people tend to believe what they've seen and heard and things that have kept been kept quiet or secret, they are as new to them. And people also tend to think, particularly with my father, that they, um, own him because he's been a part of so many people's lives for so long. So, uh, in answer to your question, uh, I don't expect everyone to believe, uh, people who know me. Uh, and know my story, but like anything else, unless you know what you're knowing, you don't really know. Absolutely. Now, um, can you tell us about your book that you wrote? Uh, yes. Um, I spent, I started writing it in the fall of 77, right after he left. Um, and I just finished it up right after Lisa Marie died. So it actually covers from 1970 seven until now so that's you know what um i'm 68 now i'm oh, 67 now so that uh, i spent almost 50 years writing the book 45 and now, so, oh sorry I, I didn't mean to cut you off but uh, okay. what, uh, what can readers expect from this book uh okay well first of all it's um it's called a memoirs of a star sea child some people don't understand what that is but um 
and it sounds probably a little far out to some people, but um, I believe that we're all children of the divine, God's children. And um, if you, I don't know if you know this or not, but the human physical body is made of the same um, elements as the stars. So I decided to call it that. Plus, that was an idea of my father's to call it that. Um, and then I called, um, subtitled it, uh, Elvis, Marlon, Christian, and me. Um, and that was at the request of my um, uh, a, a producer friend of mine. Um, and it's because it's not about celebrity. It's not about Marlon Brando or um, Elvis Presley. It's about uh, my life um, as my father's daughter, not knowing it. And also, um, I go into my husband's life um, who was Christian Brando, who was Marlon Brando's oldest son. And it's really a spiritual uh, story of seeking answers, like why did this happen and and um, what am I supposed to do with the information? And, and my whole life, I really only just wanted to help people. I'm a caregiver. I uh, take care of children with autism. And it's really just about helping people realize that we all go through things. I mean, how many people out there did not know who their biological father was? How many people are adopted? How many people feel abandoned? How many people feel um, unloved and, and unwanted? And it's really about all of these things are within us if we just have faith and know that God uh, doesn't give us any problems that we can't solve. So that's the essence of the story. It's just me looking for truth and to find out who I am and and what I'm doing here, basically. Now, now um, do you think there's other people yeah. out there that has uh, that's related to Elvis? Like maybe it's their son, or maybe like an, or maybe like another daughter. Right. Do you think there's people out there like that? Oh, I know there are. I'm actually working. Um, am I supposed to be hearing something else? Uh, don't think so. I hear. I hear you saying what you were saying in the very beginning. Oh, you might be on a time delay. I don't know. Oh, my goodness. What do I do about that? I just keep talking. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So uh, there are actually others. Um, I'm close to a boy named John Smith, and he was raised by my grandmother Gladys's brother. Um, and he's four years younger than I am. And his name is John Smith. And... He's the only one I've ever really met, except for Thomas. Um, so I don't think it's rational to think that my father had only one child. But he did have only one legal child in wedlock, so that is true. But I do believe that there are others. Now, and, uh, and when this interview goes up on January 8th, oh, it will be one year since Lisa Marie passed away. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, I guess, memories or... Uh, what you thought about her? I talk about that in the book, and actually she passed away on January 12th. And um, I always knew where she was. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. We were always in close proximity. Uh, we talked one time, and she was pretty much influenced by her mother and by Scientology. And uh, I did go to court, um, but they ruled that I'm born out of wedlock, so I have no inheritable rights. But uh, I always thought, knew what she was doing and uh, through a third party. And um, we have mutual friends. And also, I was married to Marlon, as I said, son Christian. And Marlon was very close to Michael Jackson. So she was always in cl close proximity. But um, I always extended myself to her, but we were never really close. But um, we were completely aware of each other. And I. She always knew what I was doing and always knew what she was doing. Now, and what is your thoughts? Have you seen the movie? And, and what is your thoughts on the Priscilla movie? I think that that movie did... Well, first of all, you have to realize that Sofia Coppola is Nicolas Cage's cousin. So yeah. Lisa um, was cousin-in-law to Sofia. And so Sofia uh, knew that Lisa Marie had written... Uh, Sophia last year and told her she did not want the movie to come out because it put my father into a bad light. But I personally went to see it and I think that it completely showed um, from Priscilla's perspective. And I believe that my father never loved her the way that she loved him. 
And I think that was pretty clear in the film. And it's really sad because Priscilla's built her whole life around him. And um, I've had encounters with her, uh, which are in the book. And um, I think that that was a, very, a beautiful movie. First of all, it was beautifully done. It was all of the, um, the costuming and everything was just beautiful. The time frame was captured perfectly. And uh, I thought it was a very good movie. It didn't make a lot of movie uh, money. I think they spent like $20 million and it only made $10 million at the box office so far. So I don't think it did well in the public, but I think it told her story very well. And it was based on her book, too. So yeah. it, it did that. Now, um, people have their own opinions on who Elvis really loved, between uh, Priscilla to Linda to uh, Ginger and so forth. Who do you think, uh, he, uh, which I guess, who really loved him or, or who he really loved? Well, <clears throat> without sounding presumptuous, I believe that my mother was the first love he ha had, and she really broke his heart because she chose the money over love. Because at the time that I was conceived, as I said, he was not in a position to be a father or have a child. And my mother married one of the most wealthy to one of the most wealthy families in North Carolina, Charlotte. They were construction workers. Uh, the man who raised me had a brand new 55 Chevrolet uh, when he turned 16 and 55. And my father was basically, bar you know, they were using a family car that they shared with the cousins. But um, I think my mother broke his heart. And if you read my book, I have a letter in there from Marty Locker. And it's pretty unanimous between people who knew him that he was not really marriage material for anyone. And I believe that his heart was broken really young and that he never really got over that. That's my own opinion. But oh, I know yes. he loved Linda. I know he loved Ginger. I know he loved Priscilla, but not in a way that kept him faithful or, you know, the way that they probably wanted it to be. Now, do you think uh, that the Colonel kind of ran Elvis into the ground? That's complicated. I'm very close to a guy named Greg McDonald, who was raised by the Colonel. And he actually has a book, too. And he went on to uh, manage uh, Backstreet Boys uh, and promote NSYNC. And he managed Ricky Nelson. And he tells me that actually the Colonel, they were sort of like two parts of a whole. I don't believe that the Colonel, they, my father could have done what he did without the Colonel. And um I believe there was a, a deep love between the two of them. I think my father had a lot of respect for him, but yes, he did call the shots. I met him in 70, the Colonel in 77, and he had made up his mind back when my mother, when he discovered my mother was pregnant with me, that there was no way that a child could be involved. And so he did control his life to a certain degree, but without him, they were just like the sun and the moon. I mean, they needed each other uh, to exist. But um, And I also people think that he gave 50% of his income to the colonel, but that was based on the uh, gross income, uh, the net income, not the gross income. So there's a lot of things people don't really understand. But, yeah, he did run the show, and but he was not a villain. I don't believe that. Now, and where was you on August 16th, 1977? Again, that's in the book. Uh, I was waiting for my mother to come over and tell me exactly what was going on because I confronted her and asked her if that was if he was my father in February, and she just burst into tears. And I was waiting for my mother to come over, and she had just... I was raised Mormon, so she was waiting for her divorce to come through, and her divorce came through on the day that he died, and that was the day that she told me the truth. So that was a very difficult day for me. I remember hearing it come over the radio while I was waiting on my mom to come and tell me the truth. And uh, it was surreal. I mean, I could hear his voice on the radio. My mother came in the front door and I just said, can you tell me now? He's gone. And she just... Uh, she said, yes, it's true, Deborah, and you have to promise me one thing. And I said, what? And she said, you'll never do anything to bring me shame to his name. And so it's like I gained and lost a father in one day. But that's where I was and what happened. 
Wow. Now, uh, do you, now, have you ever been to Graceland? Yes. And I actually have memories of going there um, because I, my father was in my life until I was about four when I was able to start talking. I do remember going and meeting him uh, on movie sets where there were like big rooms and a lot of people. I remember him having a pony for me at Graceland when I was just little. Um, that was my, those are my memories as a child. Um, but I did go, the press paid me to go to do stories in uh, 88. So, and then I went a couple of years ago, but to me, it's very sad because nobody's home, you know, it's, uh, it's sad. And I know that Riley's getting ready to make some changes uh, because Lisa would go there for the holidays and that was her sanctuary. So she would be upstairs and, and spend time there uh, at holidays and things. But now that she's gone, they're talking about opening the upstairs and, and making it a place where people can get married and film and do filming and um, make it more into a museum. But to me, it's sad because that's my family's home and it's just, there's nobody there, you know? And so I get, I don't like to go. I go for publicity reasons sometimes, but, and I can remember being there as a child, like in my grandmother's room. And so I have a different perception of it, but as long as it makes people happy, that's good. Now, speaking of Graceland, uh, did you watch the Christmas at Graceland special? I haven't had a TV since 1990 something, <laughs> but I saw pieces of it. Yeah. And I hear everything that you were saying in the beginning at the, over this, but I'm going to keep going. Um, I saw clips of it afterwards, and I thought it was great. Um, you know, this would have never happened if we, when Lisa was alive. But I think Riley's uh, taken over and doing a really good job because people love my father. And they he reminds them of different times in their lives. Like you said, I've met so many people that remember exactly where they were on that day. And he was a spiritual being. And he loved humanity so much. And he gave them everything that he had, and then some. <laughs> and so, um, I forgot the question, but um, I think that was great. And I think they'll probably have it uh, every year now because the ratings were very high. They were almost as high as the uh, Rockefeller. Oh, yeah. So, and I think it joins families. And I think that especially after COVID, uh, we're all looking for something that we had before that we don't have now. I don't want to get emotional, but um, I think that that's a good thing for a gift to the world from him. Yeah, I think it's great. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, now you talked about uh, going to court over uh, the uh, – I'm going to court over this whole thing. Why do you think that they didn't um, uh, uh, kind of accept uh, – uh, kind of like what you brought to the table? Well, what happened was I was very close to Larry Geller, who was my father's hairdresser and spiritual advisor and a very good friend. Um, I read his book in 1977, the minute, and then I went straight from Carolina to Los Angeles because I wanted to know someone who knew my father as a human being on a day-to-day -day basis, not as an icon or some guy in a white jumpsuit. I wanted to know um, how he thought and what he believed in and, and just how he was as a human being. So. Larry Geller picked me up the first day I was in Los Angeles on the first day of summer, 1980. And he put, he put me in Malibu to live. He was like a father to me for many years. And he gave me a copy of the will after I was doing talk shows. And I had no desire to go public, but my husband at the time sold me out to the tabloid. And mm. he came home one day and said, you're going to be in these magazines about your story. And I'm like, what? Because I didn't even know how that worked. So Larry gave me a copy of the will, and in the will, my father leaves everything to Lisa Marie and any other lawful issue I might have to be divided in separate and equal trust. But that's not the real will. There was a will that he wrote that was destroyed, which I talk about in the book, and other people have talked about it, uh, but it was destroyed by Priscilla and his father because it was too generous to too many people. So the will that was probated... Uh, I did go to court, and they're saying that they concede that I'm his daughter. That's in the court documents. But since he didn't marry my mother, that I have no inheritable rights. Mm, yeah. I know he wouldn't have wanted it that way, but Priscilla and my grandfather wanted to protect Lisa. So I understand it, but uh, 
and even now, that's why I don't get sued or anything, because they've conceded I'm his natural daughter. I just don't have the right to inherit because I wasn't born in wedlock to him. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying that they so they said that you are Elvis's daughter, but since he didn't marry your mother, right. you don't have the rights to none of that stuff. According to the will that they probated. Yeah. It's not the real will, because in the real will, he did leave to other children. But to Priscilla and the state of Tennessee, because if you think about it, Graceland brings in more money into Tennessee. It's the second most visited house in the oh, United yeah. States. So there were reasons for wanting to protect it. And so I'm not lawful because my mother, I'm um, actually lawfully another man's because my mother was married to someone else when I was, she had me. So yeah, it's just a technicality, but saves them millions. And uh, But they did concede that for the sake of the case that I'm his daughter, but again, there's nothing I could do to go back and make my parents married. So that's oh, yeah. it. Now, um, have you ever thought about, about taking a, a, a DNA test? I've already done all that. Oh, you've already done that? I've already done that. In 1988, I uh, back then, we couldn't just go to ancestry.com or just go swab your cheek. Back then, get the best DNA, best blood. We didn't even call it DNA. We called it blood testing. So I got tests from my father's paternity suit in 72, and I matched that at UCLA and Selmark and Bethesda, Maryland, and everything came back matching. But even that didn't matter to the estate because that doesn't make me lawful. Oh, so yeah. I've already done all that. And oh. so um, and it's so funny because people of your generation and and, the, and they're even in their 40s and 50s think it's so simple. But back in the day, it was blood tests and, and it wasn't anything like it is now. Plus, there's no DNA of his to, ta to match to today. I mean, unless I did it with Riley. But since I've already done it and it's not going to benefit me in terms of inheritance, um, I just think, you know, there's no need to try to get DNA from a place that doesn't really exist. But I did match with cousins and, and all that. But, uh, again, it doesn't, uh, it, it, it doesn't make a difference in anything legal. All right. Now, um, what do you, now with this interview, what do you expect the people listening to take away from this? I think a lot of, I think we're living in a society where everything is instant and, and everything you look at, whether it's on the internet or, you know, wherever you are, even in text, if, if, if people don't have an instant understanding, they reject. It. So I don't, I think there are people that are um, spiritual people that understand, you know, that will, and I have a lot of people, I have lots of people on my Facebook, um, um, and I have so many people that are supportive and do believe me and take me as a human being and not just Elvis's daughter, um, that it doesn't really matter to me. But people can be really mean. They'll say things like, oh, and I'm Prince Char uh, King Charles's daughter. So it can be hurtful, but at the same time, um, it's not my business what they think about me. That's true. Yeah. Um, where can people find you on the Internet? Thank you. Um, uh, my Facebook is Deborah Presley Brando, uh, and um, my website is DebraPresley.com, and that's where the book is. And the book's doing very well, but again, it's a spiritual story. If people want to read about celebrity or fame, it's not about that, because to me, fame is a thief, and fame is hollow. I mean, I was Marlon Brando's grand um, daughter-in-law and my father's daughter, and I know for a fact that fame and fortune bring misery and not much happiness. And I'd rather be happy with nothing than to be miserable with everything. Oh, there you go. Um, and where can people get the book at? Uh, you can order it from Barnes & Noble. Uh, it's on Amazon. Or if they wanted a signed copy from me, it's um, at DebraPresley.com. There you go. Um, on which usually at the end of the podcast, I like to ask the guests for closing thoughts. Do you have oh, any okay. closing thoughts? Uh, my closing thoughts. Um, just that I wish that humanity would realize that we all come from the same place. We're all God's children. Um, we all want the same things. We all want to be loved. We all want to know where we came from. 
We all want our families safe. And I think that if we would all realize that we are all of divine or origin that and loved ourselves, then we could stop all of this right now. And it is the truth. I mean, God loves all of us. We're all his children. And uh, that's it. I just want us to all realize who we are and, and how powerful we really are as God's children. Absolutely. Oh, well, Deborah, well, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast to talk about Elvis and talk about your book, which I really, uh, uh, of course, you know, oh, which I really enjoyed it. And, uh, <laughs> I'm oh, going to send you a copy. I'm going to send you a copy. All right, yeah. Oh, which I know people was thinking that I was going to come on here and kind of uh, kind of, uh, kind of bash you for, you know, for claiming to be ill with his daughter. Uh, oh, which I'm not that kind of person, so I wasn't going to do that. Well, uh, I'm grateful. God sends me people like you. Thank you for that. Oh, of course. Hold on. Thank you for coming on the podcast, which I enjoyed it. I'm sure it was some <laughs> of the people uh, that have uh, uh, pushed play on this, you know, maybe they enjoyed it. So once Thank again... You. And so once again, I want to thank you for coming on. Thank you, sweetheart. And I'll put you on mine, too. Just tell me how. All right. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye. This right here wraps up uh, the, the podcast. Check it out next Monday for a brand new episode. Until then, God bless, and we'll catch you then. Thank you. Bye-bye.